I talk a little bit about uh, Julian James. Yeah. <clears throat> I just have finished a book called Alice Hickey, which you'll see on the screen as a web address where you can go and you can download a free PDF on it before it gets published in five or six months. Uh, which, in, in fact, a large part of it is attributable to my you're bumping into the work of Julian Jane some ten years ago, who published a book in 1960, which said finally what had been going around in my head for some time, and. and because I didn't really see it. I don't think I read it until the 80s, somewhere in the 80s or something. I don't know how I bumped into it, but it's, it's called The Emergence of Consciousness, and it's a very long title, and it's a very, it's a very thick book. It's very readable once you get past the kind of scientific part in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> but what he proves through a, a whole variety of sources, being both a biologist and both being a poetry lover, by examining um, um, ancient oral poetry sources, ancient visual art that, that existed before we learned to read and write, is that man's consciousness prior to the act of writing was different than ours today. And, the, and the, there's, there's a big Julian Jane society, and of course, you know, this kind of thinking, whenever you bring something new in, there's a resistance to it, which is, which is incredible. I don't care what it is. How to make better fudge. The fudge people don't want to hear it. They, they have their ways of making fudge. So when you get to life and death matters, like what is the nature of consciousness, which affects all of our theologies and, and all of our philosophies, the thought has always been that all men, all homo sapiens, were exactly like us, except they weren't maybe quite as bright. And we just got smarter as our brains got bigger, you know, and bigger and bigger, and whatever that is. Uh, but, but what he showed is that they heard voices. And, the, and that the voices came from the left side of their, uh, uh, from the right side of their brain, which had linguistic capabilities at that time, had language capabilities. And what they existed in was a state of almost like the meditation, which, which in fact you can observe if you watch preliterate peoples who have been removed from society, and there are still some places where you can go, they'll sit and they'll be able to stare at the sun for hours or the moon or a frog. They're in a state of meditation. Come to my house, you'll see that a lot. Right. In fact, you're like that a lot too. So, so they, it's a natural, it's not something that people train themselves to do, that's the way they are. Right. And, and what happens is when they reach something, when something happens to them that they can't understand, some, some fork in the road, something happens, and they don't know how to comprehend it, a voice, which they took to be the gods, because again, all psychic events have an effect on us that we understand it to be from a higher intelligence and that it's true. The feeling, whatever we know is the feeling in us that something is true, it's true of a magnitude even higher than that. It just grabs us. We would tell them, run or kill this man, whatever it happened to be, if you met somebody on the road. You know? So uh, uh, that all their courses of action right down to Alexander the Great, is when they wanted to, by the time of Alexander the Great, we had learned to read and write, our consciousness had changed, but there were still some people who had that capability, they were called oracles, and they would go to consult the oracles as to what they should do, and they would tell them what to do. They would come out with usually something in the form of a metaphor, which is never quite clear what they had to do, so it was a very tricky proposition. But, it, it, but if they interpreted it correctly, uh, they would know what to do. And, but in terms of preliterate man, they had oracles within them that spoke to them. And uh, uh, beyond that, they were as smart as we were, but they weren't concerned with what we were concerned about. They weren't concerned with building empires, not until we began to change. What they were concerned with is to being in harmony with the dreaming. They called it many things, the gods, whatever it happens to be. And what they wanted to know was the nature of life, the nature of death, the nature of the soul. We can see that if we look at their literature and their um, statues and their art. So that's what their entire mind focus was. And that the way that they displayed that knowledge to each other was through poetry. There was no science, there was no history, there was nothing. It was only an oral poetry. So, so, so that the unconscious person, you can say, was an imitative person and was an artistic person. 
wasn't a logical explaining person. His consciousness didn't work that way. He wasn't interested in explaining why this spun like this. He didn't really care. Whereas the Greeks would go on forever arguing, well, there are atoms inside, and they, they start to move, and there's inertia. They, they, they didn't bother them. That didn't concern them. The thing that concerned them was why in a birth a baby looked like it did, and what happened to you after you died. We've kind of fudged up with those. We don't care about that anymore. You know? But the fact of the matter is we're pretty ignorant of that whole thing. And that's why you see large parts of our culture trying to reach for alternative worldviews to understand what happens to us in this journey of life from our birth to our death. Do we just disappear? Is there a life after life? Are there other spirits that are coming to accompany us? What is the nature of death? You know? So, uh, and what is the nature of the universe itself? Is it just a collection of rocks that are moving around? Because it's a big accident? No, it's not a big accident. It, it, it's an unknowable event, but it's not an accident. So anyway, that's my, that's my kind of thinking on preliterate man. If you want to read that book, I'm going to flash on the screen for you. It's Julian Jaynes, The Emergence of Consciousness in Preliterate Man. It's, if you haven't read it, then you shouldn't be taking a look at any alternative worldviews until you do. Because it will help you understand that the information you're getting from these transcriptions of ancient oral poems is very shaky information and very hard to decipher because of the act of transcription itself is very difficult and because it's going through uh, uh, translations from the original language to our language and uh, that it's constantly changing because words change their meaning as time goes on. So something that was an oral poem that was whispered on the wind 10,000 years ago when you have a little fragment of it here and you're trying to say, well, this is, this is what it means. Hey, wake up, you know. It's, it's not a document from a Sears Robot catalog, you know. It has many meanings. Oral poems, the words in an oral poem always have many meanings because in an oral culture, one word could usually use, mean many things. And it's the way that you say them and it's, it's your intonation, use of your hands that will explain what that particular word means in this instance, you know? So that, that's important to know. Uh, uh, and looking at any ancient text, even if you're going back to the very sources, which you really should, if you're gonna take somebody's word for it, that this means so-and-so, like in the ancient Babylonian and the ancient Sumerian text, you should go back to the text. There are translations of them, you know? Including the original Hebraic Bible, you'd be surprised how it translates out directly you know, and how many jumps and how many assumptions have been made to, to make it palatable for us or to direct us in a certain way.